here with you all. Good evening. And um, yeah, what I dropped in the chat, we are on tonight, slogan 57 out of 59. So we're almost there. And to, <clears throat> next week, Chandra will be teaching and then we'll come together for the last slogan, kind of a celebration um, two weeks from now. And I just wanted to share the name of the book that we'll be doing next for folks here. So this is, it's just such a beautiful book. I've been um, coming back to it in preparation for um, us spending time together with it. And it, it really brings together some of the greatest teachers in the Tibetan lineage and shares their instructions of how we wake up on the path in chapter by chapter. So I think it'll be a really nice guide for us and we, to reflect. And <clears throat> yeah, I think this evening, the Lojong slogan, I will say, I'm not trying to be rude, but it feels very familiar. So I think I'm ready for our Lojong path to be coming towards its end. Um, there's a lot of kind of similar threads that come through the Lojong. And so this one I think will be familiar to you all and a good setup for us to start, yeah, looking at some other texts, some other wisdom traditions. Um, some other wisdom teachings that they have to offer us. It feels pretty sweet to be together. It's a new moon, and I was uh, outside a little earlier today, and um, there's that real change of season feeling that's happening. And it used to be a time of year for me that I got I got quite a lot of uh, you know anticipatory anxiety about the shorter days and the cold and that shift. And I feel really grateful that, you know, my teacher has really pointed out very often that this time of year when the nights get longer and the days get shorter, it's an invitation to go inward. That's a really beautiful time of year for our practice. And I like to think of it that way of us kind of turning towards a bit, turning towards this time where there's more introspective time maybe less light in the day for people like me who chase the sunset and the sunshine, a real invitation to come inward. And it does feel like a shift, you know, it really feels like that <clears throat> seasonal shift is upon us. So we'll start with a meditation and I'm gonna invite us to do a practice that we, I don't think we have done together. Maybe Chandra has done it with you all. And I will do a version of it. I won't do the classic style of it. And this is the practice of calling upon the gurus. And the idea of a practice like this is to really kind of, as we enter any great journey, as we enter a retreat, as we enter maybe this shift of seasons, to call upon the qualities of those who we really admire. And we invite it here with us. We invite this enrichment of <clears throat> what has been learned, what has been unknown before us to just be right here with us. So we'll start with that practice and then we'll do a settling of the mind in its natural state. So in this Lojong training, we've really gone back and forth between the Tonglen and the settling of the mind in its natural state, just as the entire teaching is taking us between this ability to transform all of life's rich material with compassion, as we do in Tonglen, and the ongoing practice of training our mind training our mind so that we can pay attention, training our mind so that we can experience also a sense of openness, spaciousness, just that ability to feel some of the natural wellspring of okayness of our own awareness. So that's what we'll be delving into this evening. So without further ado, invite you to find a posture that can support your practice with or without a kitty cat. Um, I love seeing the kitties, the Sangha kitties. So how I feel sometimes like my, my cat is like a, a, like a little, it helps me ground and feel calm, like a little weighted blanket. So it can be a good, good pet companion for the practice.
And let's give ourselves a moment to really find the posture that will support us for this evening. Checking in and seeing where our spine is coming up, right from our pelvis, up from the sacrum, finding a nice upright spine. And softening through the front of the body, through the belly and the chest and the face. And finding a place where your hands can feel comfortable, maybe folded in your lap or placed on your thighs or knees. Begin by noticing the quality of stillness in the body. Stillness like the mountain. Stillness that is grounded, supported by the stable foundation. And the wonderful experience of being both stable and still alongside subtle movement, the sensations of the body being breathed. And the sensation of our prana or energy moving through our subtle body. So stillness and motion together. Take a couple moments here to fully feel and inhabit this experience of being in this beautiful, wonderful body. And for the purposes of our practice, you can invite your inner speech and dialogue to gently soften and turn down a notch. Any to-do lists, ideas, distractions, the thoughts 
images and fantasies. Just invite them for the course of this meditation to gently slip away. They may still pass through, but we don't need to prioritize them for now. You could feel or imagine this as though leaning back away from that content. Leaning back and deeper into the spaciousness of mind and awareness. And leaving that surface level of inner speech and dialogue. Feeling our presence in the body, inviting this quieting of inner speech. Let's continue to lean back into our awareness, the spaciousness of our mind. A couple more moments here, beginning, simply making our mind and body serviceable for practice by fully pouring our attention and awareness here into settling our body, speech, and mind into natural states of stability, silence, and openness. Take a moment and consider your intention for this practice together, for this path. Allow your intention to be outrageous. aiming as high and wide as you would like, fully waking up for the sake of all beings, completely overcoming difficult, destructive emotional habits. Whatever intention or aspiration inspires you at this moment is perfectly fine. And to support us in our intention and 
as we turn towards the season of longer nights, maybe more introspection, let's transition to do just a bit of attention to calling upon the gurus, calling upon our spiritual friends. We do this with the imagination. Bring to mind a teacher, someone who you have learned from, someone you admire. Could be someone you know or someone you don't know. Maybe a book you've read, a retreat you attended. And as you bring this teacher to mind, consider the qualities that they inhabit, the qualities that allow them to persevere, to grow. This quality could be heartfulness or patience, wisdom, kindness. Whatever quality it is, imagine that quality. And in this simple practice, we call out and we ask to receive some of this quality, inviting it to be here with us, imagining we could receive that quality coming to us as though it were light. And inviting <clears throat> that light to travel in through our body and to permeate, strengthen us. We'll think of a couple other teachers. They can be formal teachers. They can also be natural elements in the world, calling upon the radiance of sunlight, the luminescence of the moon. So consider another teacher who embodies the qualities that would most support you in your practice tonight and in the future. Again, imagining these qualities and asking. May I be supported in these qualities? And imagine receiving again, like beautiful light from this teacher, from this natural element receiving that which you seek to strengthen and support you. One more time, thinking again of one more teacher one more embodiment of these incredible qualities, kindness and wisdom, perseverance, fierceness, clarity, friendliness. Just consider what feels supportive for you and imagine that quality through this teacher this living being or this natural aspect of our world. And again, asking for this blessing to receive this quality, opening up and imagining that this quality would be shared poured upon you like light.
And then imagining these teachers and feeling appreciation for these blessings, the strength you're receiving, these qualities. And let them slowly fade into the background. And notice these qualities that are here with you. Reflected in these great beings, yet they were always already here. And taking a moment to really feel and connect with these qualities that will support you. With our mind, heart, and body infused with these blessings, we shift to our practice of settling the mind. Again, feeling as though we are leaning back in our mind. And this time we lean back into our mind, into the greater spaciousness of our own awareness so that we can observe thoughts, and memories, and images that pass through. It can be helpful to have the eyes slightly open, letting in brightness and removing any sense of barrier between observer and observed, the outside world and our inner experience. For this practice, relaxing the body and relaxing the mind. A pliancy of body and mind so that we can relax into our awareness and simply observe thoughts and memories and images as they arise and pass away. Just as the ocean wave arises and then returns to the ocean. And you become aware that you're caught up in a thought, memory, or image. Simply relax. Release whatever has captured your attention. And return. Keep relaxing. Notice if there's tension anywhere in the body, maybe through the face or the chest or the belly. 
Release that tension through the exhales. And see if you can settle the mind. This doesn't mean the mind is empty. It means the mind is clear. Able to see, observe, and release the movements of the mind. The thoughts that come and go. There may be gaps between the thoughts. Those gaps reveal a direct experience of our awareness. Nothing to do, nothing to create, nothing to hold on to. Just an opportunity to touch in. Keep relaxing and softening the body and mind. You may notice that the space of your awareness is not some dull, dark space. But in fact, a feeling of that clarity and brightness, openness. Very gently closing the eyes if they've been open. And turning the gaze inward to the body. And bring this vividness of our awareness to noticing sensations in the body and following the breath.
Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> Any questions or reflections from that practice? You can write in the chat, you can raise your hand, you can unmute. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been really enjoying when you lead us in a meditation. Mostly I do deity yoga. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that takes you out somewhere. It's, it's wonderful. I, yeah. I love it. But coming into my body, I have a lot of back stuff. And mm. every time, you know, like in this, it's like, parts that are tight in my back forever they relax and it's just informing me that yes it can be this way mm. it can open and flow and be aware and um it's really beautiful and it's not even the thinking it's letting the body doing it the body with the breath that just breathing the body or letting it breathe and just having the awareness there but as much as possible keeping the mind from that that that, that being quiet and mm. uh, thank you for the depth of that it was really beautiful thank mm. you oh thank you for that um for sharing that that's wonderful to hear and you know i think what you're maybe noticing is um yeah that our our thinking mind is actually generating quite a lot of content for us that we're unaware of at a kind of present moment level and the content that it's generating, of course, a lot of it is, is difficult content. It's negative rumination, right? Our, our mind is a wandering mind. Sometimes that wandering is lovely, but often that wandering is to content that's difficult. <clears throat> when we have a difficult emotion experience, there is a physiological impact in our body muscles tense, right? And I, I, can, I can really empathize, Geneva, because I too have pretty bad back issues myself. And there's like this pattern, right, of places that tighten up, and then the other things compensate, and then the other thing, and then there, there I am horizontal for a week. And, you know, that, that tightening that happens, we don't become aware of it. And I think when we do give ourselves the space in these practices to just let our awareness completely open, some of that like script that's going on in the background, some of that negative mind wandering content, I think it actually gets a moment to unwind itself, right? So Alan Wallace and, and many other teachers talk about the mind that heals itself. Uh, and one of the analogies classically is this cobra that has gotten itself tied into knots in a basket. And the only way to untie the knots of the cobra is to just open the, like release the basket. And I think in that practice, we, we do that a little, we kind of release fully um, by just giving our mind space to do so. So that's wonderful. Um, I see a Chat from Lucy, I noticed that whether I am feeling super low or negative and down, these slogans are so relevant, but they remain just as relevant when I'm feeling more positive and self-conscious. Well, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, let's hope tonight is, is not an exception to that. I think that these, you know, these slogans, um, I'm not as familiar with Psalms, but I think, you know, every wisdom tradition, um, and teaching, whether it's, you know, stories about creation myths or otherwise, that 
these simple ways to think about our life experience, to have in some ways the narrative meaning making that helps us understand who we are. Um, it's very powerful. And it, it is, it's, it's funny, <clears throat> you know, these teachings don't change, but we change. I was on a um, retreat this last weekend with my teacher, and it's the fifth retreat of the fall retreat with her that I've been on. And a lot of the content is the same, but I keep changing. <laughs> it becomes deeper and deeper with my, with my own life. And I would not dare say progress, but changing um, is, is good enough. I get to kind of look at different angles, um, the same thing. Other thoughts, questions, reflections? Yes, Nick, yes. Hi, everybody. I haven't, I haven't been to practice with you all in a while, but um, it was enjoyable. You were talking about, I, I settled down and I started to hear guru and I thought, you know what, I don't do gurus, you know? What, what is this, you know? And it, But I've had some good recovery mentors and then I'm thinking, hey, I, I just thought, I just listened to um, a talk Let's go with Ram Dass. I just listened to Ram Dass. So let's go with Ram Dass. Let's go with the loving awareness. You know, mm -hmm. and I just I kind of laughed to myself. Oh man, that's really nice. You know, and that's that's really good. You know, that is that's a guru. That's a teacher. That's yeah. like a spiritual grandparent or something of that nature. And it kind of helps me to stay grounded. May help me pay attention to what's really important for me. You know, and uh, I'm I'm a new retiree, so I'm going to have a lot of time to. To, to do some introspection and and so I, mm -hmm. I better get with it you know and uh, mm -hmm. and then I settle into my body you know that's my mostly my practice is um you know sit and sensation to the body um sounds the breath and thoughts are rising and passing away and and you know I too my back sometimes hurts and stuff that I haven't paid attention to in like but uh, it's really nice. I just wanted to kind of chime in and, and thank everybody. And uh, I really appreciate. Nice to see you, Nick. And congratulations, Mazel Tov on retirement. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it is such a nice, you know, I think for practitioners, it's such a different, we're like, it's like, ooh, this time to really invest in practice and deepen. It's lovely. Um, yeah. You know, the, I, I really, I didn't give too much preamble. I, I really rebelled against the guru practice at first myself. And, um, and, and then I, you know, uh, I, I, I feel, and this may not be, it may not be true, but I feel it's okay to, to bend a bit of these practices. So they feel relevant for us in the contemporary time. And I spent um, my first year doing this practice just with nature calling upon sunlight, calling upon moonlight, calling upon rivers, calling upon mountains. Cause I was like, I definitely have devotion for mountains that feels comfortable. And, um, and just receiving that. And then, and then, you know, the piece I think is so lovely that I haven't heard explicitly described in this guru practice, but it's that those qualities are already in you. So there's an, another practice that's somewhat familiar um, or somewhat uh, common where you have an image of the Buddha. I'm here at my altar. So my Buddha is right in front of me here. And um, you just stare at the Buddha and you imagine the qualities and imagine the qualities and kind of try to bring them on um, as your own. And that's kind of abstract. Like, I don't know. And like, I really appreciate the Buddha, but I don't know if I know him. Can I really take those qualities and then I realize that if I look at the sunset and the beauty of the sunset and the changing colors and all that, I can kind of feel a reverence and experience that that same quality of beauty and change, I am part of this natural world. So I, I think these practices of receiving blessings, again, it's like, oh my gosh, receiving blessings. It sounds very, um, um, I will just say it, it sounds woo woo. And yet it's really nice, right? We want to be mixing our mind with these positive qualities. That's the whole purpose. We're often mixing our mind with the negative rumination. Can we mix our mind with these altruistic mind states? That's the instruction, right? However we do that. And often it's our heroes or our people we look up to a Ram Dass, you know, someone who's really, um, embodying qualities we appreciate. Um, so thank you.
Leanne, hi, nice to see you. <laughs> hi. I know it's been so long. Um, I, well, speaking of the woo, I like to, or, you know, when science supports the woo, it gives us permission to woo more. Um, and so I was just curious, like, because it's, it's pretty amazing if you, you're like, I'm going, I'm calling in grace, and then you feel it, you feel it in your body. And so I'm just curious whether there's science to support it or like what you, can you speak to the phenomenon that we're experiencing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I also enjoy the science that backs it up. And, um, but it's, but you're, I will say, um, noticing it for yourself is first person introspection, which is, which is really, especially when it comes to phenomena of the mind is the best science you're going to get. Because an fMRI and EEG, like not even the most sophisticated science we have can really help us understand our own thoughts, our own internal imagery. And what these practices do is they kind of awaken a little bit of that internal imagery. Nothing can really measure and assess that, but it's, it's actually very similar to the mechanism of why compassion practices work, why empathetic joy practices work, why these Brahma Viharas work is we actually are really, really good at visualization. And it's not just Buddhists who do it. Um, athletes are really um, trained in visualization as a way to help them succeed. They imagine you know, themselves on the court, whether it's a tennis court or a basketball court. And then you also have this in, in the business world where people imagine having difficult conversations and negotiating. And so <clears throat> part of it relates to the fact that our mind, our imagination can trigger emotions. It can trigger the emotions that can sometimes get in the way of performance. So like it can trigger, like imagine you're uh, the Giants pitcher and you have to really get yourself comfortable with the crowd and the pressure. So you bring to mind that experience and you feel the fear and you work with the fear and then you can succeed. But for us, what we're doing is bringing to mind these benevolent altruistic mind states. And it really actually triggers the emotion whether it's kindness, whether it's care, um, it's, it's not exactly the same as seeing, right, Ram Dass, right? That would be like a bigger feeling, but it's in the same ballpark. And so that's why it, um, it works for us is our imagined reality and our so-called real reality that we know that's uh, also a projection. Um, they're just not that different. And this is why, I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I, I think it's important. There's not that much of a difference between watching a, you know, a, a program, um, a streaming program that contains a lot of violence and a lot of negativity and having like a more direct exposure. So I look at our contemporary media consumption and it, it, it worries me. We are triggering that same experience inside of ourselves. And so Kind of giving ourselves the enrichment of not exposing ourselves a lot to um, all the difficulty that sometimes is fabricated for our entertainment. We already have the news. That's enough. Maybe too much. Um, so yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. You know, kind of how to point out the porousness really of our mind states to imagination. Imagination is very powerful right? We know this from so many research studies. Like if you imagine something enough, you lose track of what's real. So five years from now, what you imagined and what happened, it's very hard to tell the difference. So our reality is based on our present moment, but also on our memory. And so it's, yeah, it's just very interesting what we're, um, what we're putting into the memories. Very important. Thank you. Yeah. You book on the topic of like visualization and whatnot oh well it's interesting unfortunately like it's gonna be like if you want for the science it's gonna be for athletes um oh for for, for, for any, yeah i don't know for i any. think so thupton uh chodron um thupton chodron i hope i can sell her name Nick. thupton chodron Aha, she has this incredible book on Green Tara visualization. 
Um, she is a uh, North American um, nun who has been studying in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition for more than 40 years. Really beautiful writer, really beautiful writer. Um, and that book on Green Tara, um, I, I, I am not a, a big uh, deity visualization person, but that book for me really helped me understand the practices a lot. And then, yeah, in my own heretical way, I use them. And for athletes, you had one in mind? Oh, I don't No, Yeah, but I would imagine those are all studies, but I, my guess is probably a journalist has written a book on that, but I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we get could to the you, slogan? Could you spell the lady's name? Who does the I wrote it in the chat. Oh, great. Yes. Thank you. Somehow. I missed the, the umlaut. She has an umlaut on the O's. Chodron. But. Okay. So our slogan for tonight, uh, like I said, I feel like it's somewhat it's reminiscent of a lot because I, when I'm thinking of, um, it's either don't be jealous, don't be angry, um, do not bind yourself with hatred. Um, these are kind of a, a similar theme that we've been going on <clears throat> for a couple of the slogans. And, you know, what's interesting about this one, it, it has a couple, it's not only to, um, recognize when you become jealous, when you become kind of frustrated or angry at someone. It's the idea is also to really try to, um, through body, speech and mind, not experience that frustration or that hatred. And it's funny because there's not really a, obviously with the slogans, there's not an instruction manual. There's like a lot of prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do that. Um, but sometimes it's hard to know how do we not feel jealousy? How do we not feel hatred and, and frustration, especially for those who've harmed us? You know, some of the examples um, is, you know, if someone in public says something really nasty about you, don't be angry. Just let it go. Use patience. I find that really hard. And so I was really trying to focus on, uh, we all have these. I was trying to focus on one of my particularly hard people um, who I really, who is my, obviously my greatest teacher <laughs> and who I really struggle to not feel frustration for, who, you know, I, I perceive as can make my life difficult. I perceive as, you know, probably causing harm in some ways at some times and, how do we work with these people that we have grudges with? And I, I kind of think that word is perfect. It's not used in the translations, but when I think of the real struggle of like, how do we let go of, or how do we work with these difficult people? It's not just the someone who we're temporarily frustrated with. Like, oh, I can't believe they said that. And then next week we're over it. It's like that grudge. You know, that feeling of kind of ongoing resentment. Anybody have someone they have a grudge with? Yeah. Grievance, grudge. And it can be, um, you know, it can be a group of people we don't know, like those people who aren't doing this thing or those people who are doing this thing, those people. But often it's an individual and I think when we start looking um, at grudge and we start looking at kind of what this uh, slogan is asking us to do, which is to really be able to transform body, speech, and mind, <laughs> then we actually, we need to start kind of unpacking what does it mean to be patient? What, what allows us to be patient? So it's very, um, I'm sure I've, I've spoken about this before, but the the great teachings of Shanti Deva, which we we went we actually read that book. God, I don't even remember now. A couple of years ago, sometime before the pandemic, everything pre-pandemic is forever ago. And we went through the book of Shanti Deva, and very often his instructions are: do not feel angry, 
Do not feel angry. Be like wood. Practice patience. You know, this radical patience is the only way that we should be responding to our anger. That's like so hard. It is so hard to be patient. Physiologically, right? We're triggered to an emotion in a 25th of a second. If it's anger, it has a lot of urgency, a lot of momentum. It'd be really challenging for us to have enough space to feel patience. So when I think of especially someone or like one is holding a grudge toward, um, you know, that bitterness, that anger, and, you know, this kind of, you know, rumination, right, is, is the, I think I mentioned this recently, but the actual translation of that word comes from the way that cows and deer chew grass. And they chew it over and over and over and over so that the grass becomes kind of like a nutrient milk. Um, But for most of us, we just are like chewing over and over these resentments, these grudges, these frustrations. So really, (laughs) we actually have to practice forgiveness. That's really, and it's, oh God, man, forgiveness. If there's anything harder than patience, it's forgiveness. But at least there's something to do. Like with patience, it's like, how do you even practice? (laughs) How do you get better at it, right? It's just like, okay, I'll just be like wood, whatever. And however, I can try to be like wood. Unfortunately, I think it can create a sense of suppression. And a miss, I think a very, um, um, like a real misstep in some contemporary Buddhist teachings is that people sometimes believe that the way that we should avoid difficult emotions is suppressing them. It's not okay to be angry, so don't feel it. But what we know about suppression is it actually makes the emotion stronger in our body. It doesn't actually successfully relieve us of those feelings, it makes them more strong in our body. Like we're more actually, there's a lot more activity going on. And it doesn't have an appropriate way for us to learn from or understand what that emotion is about. The grudges we hold actually usually are quite informative. They point to some kind of habit or pattern, a way of believing. It's a delusion, right? There's actually no reason to hold a grudge towards anyone if we look close enough. With our grudges, it's, it's really useful to be like, why? Why am I so upset? Okay, why? And just keep going with that and unraveling it. Unfortunately, or I won't say unfortunately, I think it's a little problematic that, um, <laughs> that a lot of the literature on forgiveness, especially in contemporary psychology, it kind of has this... Um, better than attitude. Like we should practice forgiveness so that we can kind of be better than the person who we're forgiving. Because we have so much mercy, because we are such, you know, compassionate people, we can practice forgiveness for those people down there. That just further creates the opportunities for grudges in the future. If the way that we get over or forgive someone who's harmed us is by kind of having a moral superiority, we haven't really achieved much. Maybe we've resolved temporarily for that person. This is why I get a little uncomfortable. I I, I know it's, it's, it can be helpful in the moment, but sometimes, you know, let's say for example, there's a driver who's very hazardous going so fast, cutting through traffic. And, you know, instead of saying that asshole, we're like, oh, maybe they need to get to the hospital. Right. And and, and that's nice. Like it's a nice way, but sometimes explaining away, um, it still creates a separation. So when I think of forgiveness in, in the Buddhist context, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he uses forgiveness and compassion almost interchangeably. And as we know, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama is talking about compassion, 
part of it is recognizing that every single being wants to be happy and avoid suffering. That ever whoever we have a grudge against, it's certain that their main goal, just like us, that's like all 8 billion, I think it's almost 8 billion now, want to be happy and avoid suffering. And to really start kind of poking into the emptiness of our grudge. Our grudge is such a fixed idea of a person that they're always that way. And if we have a grudge to someone we're close to, we actually get even greater insight into this because we know that they're dynamic. They're not just the person who's done this thing that has upset us. There are a lot of other things too. It's almost easier when we have grudges against people we read about in the news or hear about like, oh yeah, that person and the way they do that thing, they're definitely bad, all bad. But I think the real like compassion, the real wisdom in our compassion is just recognizing kind of the emptiness of what we're holding on to with a grudge. And, and one way I think it's important <laughs> to do this is to look at our own actions and behaviors and the ways that, you know, we don't show up so great sometimes. And towards our loved ones, we can be kind of jerks actually. It's real. Unless anyone on this call is enlightened, sometimes you show up not your best self to people you love. And in that moment, you're someone who needs forgiveness. And that's not always who you are. So I really, I really think it's, you know, I think it's a really beautiful way for us to start examining like what this slogan is asking of us. It's really asking us to do that deep work. And this is why I said these, I'm <clears throat> all due respect to the slogans. I'm also excited to, to move on to our next book because I think we've had this, some flavor of this conversation like 56 times before, right? I feel like such a big part of the entire Lojong is how do we have compassion for people who are harmful? How do we work with our very like legitimate anger and suffering towards the world? And Tonglen is a wonderful practice. It's a great way to kind of work with the, the vital energy of our suffering, of our anger. And I think the slogans invite us to kind of apply also our wisdom and think more about it. So I'd, I'd really love to, um, to hear from folks what comes up as we revisit, as we take one more circle around this very similar topic. Anything feeling new, anything feeling interesting as we think about how to not hold a grudge. <clears throat> Forgiveness. I swear to God, I remember once like going to a Dharma teaching <clears throat> and they're like, tonight we're going to work on forgiveness. And I literally left the room. I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> so that's just want to be totally honest. Okay, Denise, I see your hand. Hey, I'm going to um, my high school reunion this weekend. And a good friend of mine um, just got in a fight with me. Uh, mm -hmm. earlier evening and today and actually a good friend of mine in high school not so much of a good friend now so it was so good to be in this practice and I just got it just before <laughs> just before you started and I found myself doing Tong Lin as we were going through mm. the other exercises and breathing in his anger and hate and insecurity or whatever I was defining it as and breathing out love you know, hidden, hmm. breathing out. And it was so helpful. I, I don't know how long it will last, but it was really good. So thank you. Oh, yeah. That's what you were looking for, but uh, it helps. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, and I, I think that what can help us in the moment, it really matters. Because in the moment is when so much harm can happen 
right? So if you hadn't come with us tonight and instead texted back and, you know, who knows what could escalate and, and what helps us get through the moment, most of us are actually quite wise when we're not triggered. So if anything can get us through to that place where we have a bit more spaciousness. So thank you, Denise. Jason. Hi, Eve. Thank you so much. And, you know, what you said something that I just wanted to follow up on, which is patience. The difference between patience and forgiveness is that you said uh, patience is kind of like, you know, being like wood. It's almost like it's almost frustrating to try to be patient because because <laughs> you're like, well, what am I? Uh, uh, but forgiveness is an action is what you said. So I'm kind of curious to talk talk a little bit specifically about like the moment when you're reacting the moment that trigger starts mm. you know what what is your what what is what can we do in that this is a moment thing like i get triggered and i am i'm off i'm already gone i'm dysregulated blah 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 but i want to learn how to use forgiveness like mm. that's the foundation of not reacting and, and and it's really hard for me but i feel like i can practice that every single day so i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what action that is yeah um that's a great question and you know i i uh maybe needless to say i think about this stuff all the time <laughs> like really all the time and <clears throat> today i was really reflecting on how especially with our destructive emotion episodes, <clears throat> the ones where we just, we, we you know, create harm. Um, it is so hard to do anything in the moment. I think what's, you know, as Denise said, just being able to breathe in the moment is great. Breathing in what's difficult and breathing out with some sort of relief and, actually from that book that we're going to start with um, one of the readings I did this morning, they said, you can do Tonglen for all of your difficult emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't often think of it that way, but that, you know, you can really remedy or antidote our difficult emotions. Um, one suggestion also, this is a Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche. He was writing about it this morning and I've heard this one before. I have never tried it, but um, maybe I should try it and then we can all try it together. And it was to really bring the emotion to the forefront, like really think of like whatever it is that totally pisses you off. And then imagine everything that pisses other people off and just imagine how pissed off you could possibly be. And in, in that moment, see the formlessness of it and see it evaporate. Interesting. It doesn't say go out and rage on everybody and get angry, and but just to <clears throat> allow the force of it mm -hmm. so that you can see it. I have a feeling that's a pretty high level practice because for most of us, as you said, like we just get dysregulated. We get overwhelmed, like flooded with our experience. With forgiveness, you know, I think it would be really beautiful to kind of adhere oneself to forgiveness as an on and, and, and. I no longer walk out of the room in forgiveness and, and I have been, I have been working on forgiveness for um, some family members now for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, I do think it's a practice that's best done while you're not triggered, mm -hmm. but it will help when you get triggered, right. if that makes sense. So especially if there's specific individuals um, where their forgiveness is needed to really make it a deliberate practice of tonglen and compassion, like a meditation, you know, picture of them in front of you, <clears throat> really imagining whatever is possible to have compassion for, imagining them as a baby, imagining them helpless, imagining them as your mother in a past lifetime, right? There are all these little tricks that <clears throat> we can do. And doing that really does start to kind of like, you know, um, kind of soften our grudge so that when that person or or an idea of that person arises we have a little more practice yeah i wanted to say one thing uh but because i think it's relevant which is 
when I'm in my most spacious, most natural state of mind, I feel a sense of not being able to be harmed. You know, it's like, this, mm. like this is the quality that I am striving for, which is I'm okay. Like, I think you said, okayness, you know, like the, I'm okay. But, and when I get dysregulated, when I get reactive, I'm not okay. You know, yeah. that's the thing. I don't feel safe enough to try anything out. I'm just, yeah. I'm running for the, the hills. I'm, I'm exploding. I'm anyway. I, so I, I need, I think I'm, I want to connect forgiveness because that's immediate with the person. Yeah. But I also need to remember like that person, whoever it is with that situation can't really harm me. Yeah. That's beautiful. That, you know? Yeah. And I do think, you know, cultivating similarly, like you, you can also do that um, with like a, a photo of you mm. and practicing that for yourself. And it's especially sweet to practice with like young photos of us, mm. you know, these times that might feel a little more innocent and easy, not an innocent, forget innocent. They're just not even, and not easy, but like easy for us to care for our little us. Sometimes our adult us, we're like, God, can't you just get over it? And what's wrong with you? And blah, blah, blah. but like when we see our little us, sometimes that tenderizes us enough mm. and can help us with that compassion. And, and, you know, this again, like me, just like everybody else, like I want to be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I actually, I, I like everybody else deserve to be okay. And that might also be a really nice ongoing Cause I think you're really onto something with needing to connect to, okay. Like just like ground foundation. Okay. Cause it's true when we feel threatened and um, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to see outside of our experience and, um, and we really lose our body. So, you know, you hear me a lot talking about embodying emotional awareness and embodying our subtle body because the first thing that happens when we get triggered is we just go up and out. Yeah. And so any way that you can, you know, there was a Sangha member um, back when we had the physical space and she talked about when she got angry, she laid on the ground, mm. belly on the ground, just to get her on the ground. That was really skillful practice. That would certainly change the mood immediately too. If you're, right? If you're in a fight or something, it's like, get on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I think dogs do that well too when they submit. You know, they roll over and they're just no. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't come naturally though most of the time. Anyway, no. thank you, Dee. Thank you. Thank so- you. Yeah. I saw there was another uh a hand up, but I think it went down. Oh, Angela, there's your hand. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share, I kind of I had a breakthrough today um, about this topic. So it's interesting that you're talking about it. Um, I was let go of a contract job that was supposed to go three months. And Mm -hmm. after two weeks on Friday, they fired me. Oh, no. I was so angry, like, since Friday. And I was just like, where do I put this? Like, I don't know what to do. I was like sad and then angry. And then, and then I'd have moments of feeling okay. And, but the anger just kept coming back. And, and then I, I kept like seeing or hearing the word like perception like mm. all week. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I need to change my perception or about what happened. Um, so I kind of, I don't know if it's okay to mention other practices. Of here. course. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I do a self-inquiry practice, Byron Katie's the work where you yeah. ask yourself like the four questions. So I did that on it. And rather than ask, like, go into, they shouldn't have fired me, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, why is it so upsetting? Mm. I focused on the thought. I was like, because it was, I lost an opportunity. So I looked at that and I asked myself questions. Well, first I looked at and felt like, how does that feel in my body? Mm. And then I asked myself, um, what can not I do when I'm thinking this? Well, Mm. first I asked myself, is it even true? And then, um, and then what can't I do when I'm, and then what am I afraid will happen if I stop thinking this? That was interesting. And then who would I be if I wasn't thinking this? And then I, (laughs) 
And then I turned it around and I realized there was no loss at all. Like I didn't lose anything. Mm. If, maybe I even gained something. You know, obviously this wasn't the right job for me. I mean, it was actually pretty toxic and stressful when I think about it. Like I was actually kind of afraid of the supervisor because she was giving me like really unrealistic deadlines. So I'm actually kind of glad that it didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the yep. universe kind of did me a favor by taking it, me out of that. And yeah. all of a sudden I saw it as like a benefit to, you know, to it ending, like it, it wasn't a loss and I don't know. And it, so it was interesting. It just kind of shifted in that just from like slowing down and looking at it and, and, as, you know, and doing some inquiry and like, and the, the anger just left, like right after that, I, I feel, feel great now. That's a beautiful example of, yeah, like touching into formlessness, like being able to see the kind of immateriality and, and our grudges and even and our frustrations, right? And it's, they really are often just, they're just built on sand. And very much so, as is described in, in some of the um, translations for this slogan is a lot of it is ego clinging, mm -hmm. you know? And it sucks to get fired. I mean, come on, you know, that's very personal. And so often we can't see outside of that part and it is, it creates so much suffering. And it's so, it's so interesting, right? How um, inadvertently this idea of not ego clinging has gotten translated sometimes to be no ego, which is so threatening for most people, but God, there's nothing more liberating <laughs> than having, you know, not clinging. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions on forgiveness? Anyone still unwilling? I'm really I'm looking at Mason Pillman trying to read the facial expressions. Anyone unwilling? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I've heard this, but really? Wow, compassion. Um <laughs> the thing I want to say, thank you, Eve, such a good mm -hmm. talk tonight, um, is just the pointer and the helpfulness of like, what I'm aware of now is that my mind will co-opt anything and beat myself up with it. So like mm -hmm. really have to be careful with these slogans. Yeah. Um, and then it will co-opt anything, like any spiritual thing and try to bypass with it. So there's like a double whammy in this one a little bit where it's like, don't be jealous or don't be angry or whatever. So like, it'll co-op that and be like, you're a bad Buddhist, you're a bad, whatever, you're a bad social worker, you're a bad, all these things because I have anger, because I have jealousy, because I have human, a human emotional brain. And um, so there's that. And then it says, you know, forgive, be compassionate. So then the spiritual bypass part will be like, mm. I just have to forgive or like, um, I am forgiving or when I'm not ready. Right. Like, yeah. so I just have to be so careful with the extreme nature of the way my mind wants to, you know, like shove me into submission to being a better person, whatever the fuck that means mm. and not to take these things and you miss misuse them. And it will just do that. And so yeah. I was really appreciating um, your, you know, I was like, what's he going to say about like, don't be jealous because jealousy is an emotion that arises like, mm. right. And so I, I guess for me, the teaching is like, let jealousy or anger arise and dissipate you don't actually have to do any so the for me the teaching is like i don't have to do anything with anger or jealousy there's nothing to be done with it just to let it like have that basket cut the basket away from the cobra yeah jealousy or the anger can do its thing which is actually from learning from you if you you know pretty brief yeah. If you don't, if you don't ruminate, if you don't pick it back up and eat it again, yeah. um, which is also often inevitable. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I, I just lost track of myself, but that's what I, 
I think that's beautiful. And I think like, yes, you don't need to do anything. And the things you need to do are not, not feel it or try to be okay with it. Right. Like we have, we have Tonglen and then we have, you know, close examination of causes and conditions. Uh, some of you may be tracking in the news, um, this whistleblower on, on Facebook. And, you know, one of the things she highlighted is how toxic social media is for young girls, um, for young women. Um, and a lot of it is the, the social comparison and jealousy, right. That gets stoked up like, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a grown, I'm a grown woman. Um, and I stopped using social media for the last, I don't know, year or so pretty much. Um, and I, I did see, right. That it, it created social comparison and, and jealousy for me. And so it's like, I'm not a teenage girl where that's like a, I maybe don't have that awareness or that, um, choice. And so we also, we can exercise choice about what helps us and what hinders us. But it's funny because, you know, Pema says that letting go of anger is like letting go of anything we're addicted to. It's really, really hard. And there's a real compulsion. And with social media, you know, feeling, it feels terrible to be jealous and compare. And it's totally addictive, right? Addiction is like also a natural part of the human experience, right? we have a tendency to want to feel something from the outside that we associate with comfort, stability, goodness, whatever, power, right? It's a lot of ways that we just get entrained into this way of outside, looking at the outside, right? And um, yeah, I think it's, I think it can be an interesting process not to beat ourselves up because I love that you point pointed out not like oh man I need to figure out everything I'm doing that might contribute to my anger and eliminate it immediately because because we can't but I do think it is skillful for us to also examine like are there ways I'm kind of dipping back into certain things that reliably create these circumstances these conditions that are so harmful yeah Thank you. Okay, well, I, I am surprised slash not surprised. It's, it's already 8.55. Uh, I wanted us to do just a moment of Tonglen for our grudge, just right here. So let's find ourselves in a comfortable posture. And again, do just a brief check-in on the sensations through the body, through the face, around the eyes, and the cheekbones, and the jaw, through the chest and the belly. And for our tongue Glen, it really helps to feel a sense of deeper connection within our body and within our heart. Remembering those blessings that we called on from the gurus and remembering that they're already here. Our compassion, our kindness, our care, our clarity, it's all right here. that natural shining gold of our heart, ready to be revealed at any moment and sometimes covered up. And one of the things certainly that can cover it up is our grudges. So taking a moment first to just recognize the cost, the pain of when our heart gets covered up. when we feel tight and shut down, overcome by anger or jealousy. Very careful here to not feel bad or take on that weight or burden we shouldn't feel. Instead, just connect to that raw human experience of 
recognizing it's hard to feel those emotions. And from that recognition, generating a heartfelt aspiration to be free, to liberate this heart, to remove all the dust from the gold. And with our breath, we'll invite that aspiration. As we inhale, imagining that difficult, contracted feeling, being overwhelmed by our emotion. Transforming that and exhaling, may I be free. Sense of openness and freedom. So a couple more breaths together, inhaling with this recognition of the difficulty of being separate from our true nature. Exhale, light, freedom, openness. Inhaling, understanding the disconnection. Exhale, forging that connection back to ourselves. And taking a moment together to consider the potential benefit, the meaning of being together tonight. Dedicating ourselves on this path of learning and sharing with the hope that all beings everywhere could know the true causes of happiness, could be free from suffering, could know peace and ease, belonging and safety. Thank you, beautiful Sangha. Appreciate you all being here. <laughs> Thank you for your practice. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>